This is an interview with Dr. Harry Brickman in his office on July 9th, 1999, and the interviewer is Francis Lomas Feldman. Why don't you say something so we can hear how you sound? Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and have this opportunity to reflect on my career in mental health and to uh, engage in this discussion with you. Doing what it's supposed to do. Yes. Uh, let me ask you, uh, Harry, have you ever had an oral history interview before? No, actually I haven't. Because I like to know that in case there is one, and then we can borrow that and have a copy of it as well. Okay. Uh, so we'll just start from, fra from fresh, uh, from scrap, from scratch is what I really wanted to say. Uh, why don't we start by your telling me about your background, how you got into medicine, into mental health. I was uh, interested in medicine for a number of years, uh, even before I went to high school. Uh, and um, then when I was uh, in college, undergraduate college, I, uh, Where was that? that was at Washington Square College, NYU in New York. Uh, I got very interested in psychology. And at that time, clinical psychology almost didn't exist because it really was a product of uh, wartime psychiatry and psychology. And I asked my professor, uh, what are the possibilities of working with troubled people as a psychologist? And he told me very pointedly, uh, look, uh, I love psychology. I'm an academic psychologist. I love to teach it. I love to do the particular kind of research I do. But if you're going to do clinical work, get a medical degree and go into psychiatry. And that's what I did. And at my medical school, which was NYU, there was a very active and vigorous psychiatry department uh, at the Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital. And I really got fascinated with it. And uh, after less than a year in medical school, was sure that I wanted to go into psychiatry. It was wartime. And uh, I had gone into the Army, uh, which assisted in, in my medical school because they paid my tuition, et cetera, et cetera. And near the end of my medical school, I became aware of the Menninger brothers, Carl and Will and decided that I would like to go to Topeka for my psychiatric residency. Uh, one of the uh, distinctive things about Will Menninger was that, first of all, he was chief of psychiatry uh, for the U.S. Army during World War II. Secondly, uh, he had a very strong community orientation. He was very much interested in the spread of psychiatry and mental health services uh, throughout the community, he would make public talks to that effect uh, whenever he was in New York. And uh, so he, in certain ways, was a role model for me. When I came to Topeka, um, it was a very uh, intensive and extremely stimulating psychiatric training program. And in certain ways, Carl Menninger uh, echoed his younger brother, Will, by saying uh, he was given to rather extreme assertions. He would say, I don't believe 
that uh, a no, I'll put it another way. I believe that psychiatric training is wasted if a psychiatrist trained at a place like this just goes out and spends the rest of his professional life just with a few office patients. And that really took hold as well for me. Um, actually, for a number of reasons, I spent my last year of psychiatric training at the VA hospital in Palo Alto and at Langley Porter in San Francisco. Uh, I, I, um, I was interested in uh, doing something with the community, but I didn't know quite how I would arrange that. Uh, but at the end of my residency, I uh, was offered a position as chief psychiatrist or chief of a new state mental hygiene clinic that was opening up in Riverside. It was, as you I'm sure remember, one of a number of state mental hygiene clinics throughout the state. And uh, that appealed to me for a variety of reasons, one of which was that uh, living in the damp climate by San Francisco Bay was exacerbating uh, sinus problems. I wanted to dry out. Riverside was more of a kind of desert type community. And so I started the, um, the mental health uh, the mental hygiene clinic in Riverside right from the very beginning. And I enjoyed that very much. However, after a year, okay, so sorry. after a year, I was called up into the military service. I had to repay the, um, the services investment in my medical education. It was a Korean War. I chose to go into the Navy and um, um, there was nothing particularly, yes, there was one thing in the Navy that I did that more or less whetted my appetite to work with people who had um, responsibilities for clients in the broadest sense of the term. In this particular case, the clients were prisoners in the naval prison. And I was prisoners of uh, any country? Uh, no, they were there were uh, navy prisoners, mm -hmm. navy and marine uh, <coughs> personnel who uh, were sent to the naval prison mm -hmm. and then adjudicated to require federal prisons or to serve their time in the naval prison, and it was. Um, conducted, it was run by the Marines. So I was assigned to that prison as a psychiatrist. And I found that um, it was useful to talk with the Marine guards and even to hold some seminars with them about uh, what was going on in the inner worlds of their prisoners, all of whom were young men, uh, some of whom had actually been convicted for quite, uh, for, of quite serious crimes, including murder. Um, and I enjoyed that kind of relationship with the guards. Um, when it came time to leave the Navy after two years, I um, took another job in corrections, and that was as clinical director of the Youth Authority Reception Center Clinic in Norwalk, uh, where um, 
I was promised a, um, a clinic which would treat offenders with uh, dynamic psychotherapy. Uh, that promise did not materialize and um, after being there for a while I went into uh, to practice, to uh, private practice and then I was recruited by UCLA to be full-time there as chief of the outpatient department in the new uh, NPI which at that time was only in Quonset huts and surplus uh, military buildings, uh, mostly where the Jules Stein Institute is now. Um, during that time, uh, I, I did not have any specific opportunities for community mental health activity. It was mainly teaching and supervising residents and uh, medical students, holding conferences with uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and so forth. But I think one of the more relevant uh, experiences that I had was that I had the opportunity to work with a, um, a staff sociologist. Uh, uh, the, the Department of Psychiatry had hired a sociologist to spend part-time uh, with the um, Department of Psychiatry and part-time on the campus. Uh, this man, Harold Darfinkel, later went on to be chairman of sociology mm -hmm. at UCLA. I imagine by now he's retired. But one of the things that um, I did with Hal Darfinkel was to um, talk with him about his ideas about the sociology of mental illness. And he was fresh from a Harvard PhD where he had studied uh, very much with Talcott Parsons. And uh, he was very enthusiastic about Parsons' ideas and passed them on to me. And I developed a very strong curiosity about the circumstances under which the mentally sick role was acquired, sustained, relinquished and so forth. It, it gave me an additional dimension beside my medical dimension, a really sociological direction, uh, dimension, thinking in terms of the social falls, uh, uh, social forces that were um, uh, implicated in the in, in sick role behavior. As a matter of fact, he and I started a research project which, to my regret, I must say, I think he continued without me, without consulting with me, but nevertheless, we started it together and um, after four years there, uh, it was clear that the new building would be built and I was offered the position of clinical director of um, fundamentally the hospital and outpatient service. At that time, I was um, very enthusiastic about a very particular program principle, and I, I proposed to Norman Brill, who at that time was chairman of the department, that uh, I be allowed to organize the, uh, the teaching services in the NPI according to a principle whereby we would have a basic clinical team 
uh, a, a, an attending, maybe two levels of residents, medical students, social worker, psychologist, who would literally follow a patient from the point of outpatient to admission, to working with them in, in the inpatient phase, to rehabilitation, and so on and so forth. And um, Norm Brill just wasn't interested in that. He wanted something conventional, probably for good reasons. And, and uh, this was, from his point of view, too untried, too innovative, too difficult to conceive of administratively and so forth. Uh, and so um, I was very, very torn about continuing with UCLA. I, at that time, didn't have the um, financial resources to go on the tenure track, which paid very, very low. And one of my dear colleagues did go on the tenure track, and that was Robert Stoller, of whom I'm sure you've heard. And he made a distinguished career for himself. But he was extremely wealthy and uh, didn't mind the, I forget, 10 or 12,000 a year they were paying at that point. So at that point, I was recruited for director of mental health for LA County. And um, a new department was to be established, and uh, I was recruited to be director of that department. And the, uh, this was reflecting the uh, passage, maybe nine months previously, of the Short Doyle Act. So which, this was in 1957. Yeah. So. Um, and I, I don't need to go into the details of the short time. No, you might just say briefly what it... Uh, yeah, it was a provision that the state had to reimburse um, counties in the state for um, what was broadly called preventive services, uh, in this case mainly outpatient services uh, and consultation communities um, and at that point the state was um, reimbursing the counties at the 50% level. At that time I don't recollect any specific mention that the intention was to empty out the state hospitals. That came somewhat later. It was seen as preventive and um, as I considered the position, I began to do a little extra reading in it, and I came across the work of Gerald Kaplan at Harvard. You're probably yes. familiar with Yes, Harvard. I know him. And um, I was very impressed by his principles of extending to the community the ser uh, mental health services from psychiatric clinics and so forth. So, furthermore, I saw an opportunity to set up a program more or less from scratch. I say more or less because there were already services in existence. The, uh, the psychiatric services at the, uh, at that point it was called the County Hospital, now it's called County USC. Uh, some new services that were just being set up at, at Harbor and some services at Olive View Hospital in the Valley. And uh, I saw an opportunity to do two things, one of which is try out Kaplan's ideas. The other is to try out the ideas that I had discussed with Garfinkel uh, that stemmed from Parsons' work on, um, on social role behavior. So I conceived of a, a programmatic philosophy that I thought would be um, 
a, 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 an opportunity to implement with this new service. I was very idealistic, Francis. I was, let me see, 30, 36 years old when I took that job. And, um, and I, I had this picture in mind of, and, and I, I wrote and published about it too, about um, the, the mental health team, the professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, uh, serving as um, not so much case finders, but quite the opposite, uh, of going out to the community, what we used to call then caretakers. Now I think that's considered uh, perhaps a little too patronizing. It's caregivers. <laughs> now it's called providers, isn't it? Providers. Um, of, of a variety of community services, health, welfare, uh, education, um, probation, and so forth. And, and, and the concept, and I, as I, I made it clear and uh, actually talked with some of the county supervisors personally when they interviewed me about it, uh, was to set this um, this mental health service up so that it would, I remember I used the term, ride on the shoulders of established community caretakers. And the idea was to enrich their capacity to deal with the mental health programs of their essentially non-mental health caseloads, mm -hmm. uh, with the idea that this would uh, help make them more efficient, help them not only deal directly, well, first of all, to deal directly and more effectively with the emotional problems of their um, welfare recipients, uh, probationers, um, uh, students, etc., but to regard case finding as secondary to that, where they would uh, not just refer a client who is difficult, but having had consultation in dealing with difficult clients where there was really uh, more or less incontrovertible evidence of, of uh, mental illness, that these would be the people that would be sent to the definitive mental health professionals in the community. So that was that was the program philosophy. It was very exciting to me. And um, I took the job, or rather they gave me the job, and I proceeded to build the program. Well, <laughs> there were a number of obstacles. Um, there were turf issues with people that were already running some of the component prob uh, programs. Excuse me. Um, some of these were on the part of people who were otherwise very good, very capable people. One of them is Ed Stanger at, uh, at USC, who really wanted me to back off from any involvement with his program. Uh, that also applied, in fact, came to a kind of critical head with the man who was in charge of psychiatry at, um, at Harbor, but at that point was called Harbor General, now it's called Harbor UCLA, a man um, by the name of uh, Peter Tedesco. I don't know whether you knew Tedesco. I know the name. Yeah. What were they objecting to? Well, I, I'm a little ahead of myself because the um, federal program uh, had been announced and the uh, concept of catchment areas had been promulgated at the federal level. Um, and the National Institute of Mental Health 
uh, took a kind of proprietary interest in the development of mental, uh, community mental health services all over the country. But to my knowledge, little or no money came with it. But catchment areas became part of our jargon. I did not like that kind of term because, first of all, it was derived from flood control, uh, implying that uh, the mentally ill were flooding the community. Secondly, it implied case finding, and I wanted to keep case finding secondary. I was, by the way, successful in recruiting a substantial number of um, psychiatrists in private practice, many of whom were psychoanalysts. Uh, to serve as consultants to these various social agencies. And I arranged for in-service training for them and actually had Gerald Kaplan come to Los Angeles and preside over a couple of meetings. A number of these psychoanalysts uh, made major commitments to uh, community mental health. Uh, one of them was Alex Rogowski, who uh, was really pretty much in charge of uh, our services to, um, um, to welfare, to uh, the Department of uh, Public Social Service in the county. Uh, he conducted seminars. He was very enthusiastic about the approach and so forth. The other was Irv Berkowitz, who uh, took a very active position in schools and really made a substantial part of his career uh, working in consultation with schools, published books on the matter, and so forth. Um, so that was a way of bringing an enrichment by using existing resources in the community. Um, the, the difficulties with Harbor were, came when, um, I think it was after Landerman got into the picture. Um, Landerman was an assemblyman who took an interest in mental health and a, um, an amended short dialogue uh, passed in, do you remember the year? Uh, yes, I think it was 1962. Yeah, it was a couple of years after mm -hmm. I started, and it became the Lanterman uh, Petra Short. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point, the state, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, Francis, but my understanding is that it was at that time that the state uh, made it a matter of policy of uh, encouraging the development of community facilities as an alternative to state hospitalization. And um, being the enthusiastic and idealistic young guy that I was at that time, I embraced it. Although I always had some level of reservation about uh, whether the state would indeed give us the funds that would allow us to establish really a full range of services in the community, ranging from uh, conventional outpatient to uh, daycare, to night care, to rehabilitation facilities, and so forth. It turns out they did not. And as far as I'm concerned, that was a real betrayal of public trust. The um, county supervisors really got up in arms about it, and uh, some of the more conservative ones who had opposed our program to begin with uh, were in a position of saying, I told you so. They're going to um, uh, put, lay the responsibility of all the care of these people on our shoulders, the local communities, and never give us the money, enough money, to, uh, to do it. And I really feel they were right. 
Well, they were right, uh, although some of them were so identified with uh, Ronald Reagan that they accepted it because he didn't want the state hospitals to continue. Yes, that's my understanding too, mm -hmm. exactly. And um, so what happened as a consequence was that we were required to a greater and greater extent to do clinical services with um, uh, people who were, uh, who had major mental illness and that was a major thrust of the um, publication of the National Mental Health, the recommendations of the National Mental Health Commission um, that came out again I'll have to ask you for the date. Do you remember the date? Well, I think it was in 66, but I'm not sure. I think that sounds right to me. And, and so that, um, although I myself continued to have academic interests, I became more and more aware that the obligation fundamentally was a service obligation. And that while we should, of course, continue to do our consultative programs, we had to build clinical services as well. And that was where I got into a dispute with Peter Tedesco, because Peter uh, wanted to be highly selective about the patients that were accepted at Harvard based on teaching and research needs. And I told him that while I was uh, at the gut level very sympathetic with his interests, the fact is that um, we, we, we were no longer entitled to use public money to, um, to fund a major part of our clinical program to run a psychiatric museum. I remember that's what I said, and he took great exception to that. I said that, in effect, you're going to have to take every patient that is referred to you for inpatient care uh, unless you have really valid clinical reasons to not admit them, such as uh, full wards and so forth. Uh, he objected vociferously to it and got me into a lot of contention with uh, Jolly West who uh, became the chair of psychiatry at UCLA and, and so forth. Uh, we opened a number of new services. These were almost entirely outpatient services. Uh, the, the emphasis at the national level of working with those with major illness, uh, major mental illness, we absolutely took seriously and uh, we instructed our clinicians to do that. Um, it, it turned into uh, clinical services that were largely um, dispensing medication with little or no um, concomitant psychotherapy, which my view was then and still is, was bad medicine. Uh, but uh, in certain ways we were so overwhelmed with clinical caseloads that we in many ways had no alternative. Mm -hmm. we, we also expanded contract services. We contracted with existing uh, private or otherwise supported uh, mental health services and uh, extended our clinical services that way. Um, there were changes in the law having to do with commitment, and uh, I developed the concept of a psychiatric emergency team, which was called the PET team, uh, which would uh, be headquartered in the regional mental health services and be available for psychiatric emergencies in the community. To my knowledge, we're still doing that. This is when the emphasis began to be on voluntary commitment? Uh, yes, that's correct, yeah. Um, 
a fundamental mistake as far as I'm concerned, although I'm appreciative and sympathetic with the civil rights uh, orientation. I think it went too far. And as a consequence, uh, the mentally ill appeared more and more among the homeless on the streets, and this is still so. Um, there, there are people right here on my corner, maybe not right now, who are mentally ill home, homeless, obviously hallucinating, gesticulating, and so forth, uh, who are clearly non-compliant, if they ever were prescribed medication, who, who need care. These are people that are disruptive. These are people that um, call forth largely compassionate responses on the part of the public and concern about what's going to happen to these people. They're poorly clothed, they're obviously unhygienic, and so forth. We dumped a lot of chronically mentally un unhealthy people on the streets and did not give them the care that they needed. It seems to me that some kind of compromise uh, in the way uh, we committed people should have been developed where their, the force of the law would require them to get medication and uh, uh, and here I'm really talking about the severely mentally ill and so forth. That's, that's my view. Um, the, the job became more and more political for me, and I never, I didn't regard myself as a politician, and still don't, and I didn't enjoy having to engage in the maneuvers that were necessary. Uh, for example, uh, a particular contract uh, director would get the ear of a supervisor as a department head, and at one point my department was one of the larger ones in the county, I was directly responsible to the five elected supervisors. Uh, but let's say uh, a contract uh, administrator would have the ear of a particular supervisor, and I remember one case really quite vividly, when uh, I had said to that contractor, I cannot give you more money for your services because I only have a certain pot of money that I have to distribute around the county and so forth. He began to lean on me very heavily, and the next thing I knew, I was called in to the supervisor's office. In this particular case, the supervisor was Warren Dorn. And I went into Warren's office, and there was the contract uh, uh, chief standing behind Dorn's chair, behind desk, and I felt the geography of that situation really spelled out what the situation was, that he was being the power behind the throne. And Doran began to lean on me very, very heavily. Well, I resorted to something that I didn't enjoy doing, but which any good politician I think would do. Namely, I enlisted the assistance of, I forget, two or three other supervisors to balance off Doran and said to them, look, I'm being pressured to um, funnel an undue amount of contract funds to the, uh, I think at that point, the West San Fernando Valley. And if I do that, there'll be less for uh, your district as well, <laughs> and so they balanced it out. I, I, I didn't, I didn't enjoy doing it, I, although I understood that that's what you have to do. Um, 
And then, um, to add insult to injury for me, a decision was made in the name of efficiency to set up a super agency bringing together the health and hospitals department with mental health in one health agency. Uh, at that, and uh, at that point it was under the direction of uh, Liston Witherell. I don't know what he Oh, yes, remember. I remember him. Yeah. And um, List was very much a smooth politician and uh, was full of reinsurances to me that I would have a lot of autonomy in the agency and so forth. But I quickly found out that that wasn't so because I was expected to report to the medical director, a man by the name of John Affelt. I don't know whether you knew yes, him. Yes, I know. I knew him. I don't know if he's still alive. I don't know either. <laughs> Affelt was very, very clearly antagonistic to psychiatry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was a surgeon, and I'm not implying that all surgeons are antagonistic. No, but I think he had developed the reputation of being anti-mental health. Yes, yes. So I found it enormously frustrating and unpleasant to deal with him. And as a result, I resigned. I, I didn't see, I, you know, I, uh, all during that time I had a small uh, private practice going. I finished my psychoanalytic training. I got on the faculty of the... Um, of the uh, Psychoanalytic Institute. Uh, I supervised uh, residents at UCLA. And as a matter of fact, I started the Division of um, Community Mental Health Services in the Department of Psychiatry at USC. I don't know whether you knew that. I didn't know that. Yes, I started that. Ed Stainbrook invited me to do that. And it was actually a paid position mm -hmm. at USC, but I found after six months that I could not do it justice and do my county job and do my private practice uh, and um, my teaching at the institute and so forth. So I gave that up and passed that on to Alex Rogowski, mm -hmm. who did a one, as far as I'm concerned, a wonderful job with it. And, uh, so, at that point, I decided uh, that it, it, there was no future for me in this, and I didn't want to hang around until the politicians realized that the super agency really wasn't working. How long had you been there then? Um, I left in 1976. It was 16 years. Mm -hmm. And I remember Jack uh, was very supportive. Uh, from my point uh, of view. Jack, as you know, was chair of the Mental Health Advisory Board for a number of years. I don't remember, what, what year did Jack die? He died in uh, 77. 77. So it was just a year after I, uh, after I resigned. And Jack was an enormous help to me because, well, you know Jack, he was very diplomatic. Jack was I think it's fair to say um, the the first and most prominent analyst in the community to really um, show an interest in the community. And that may have been as a result of his kid sister. I, I don't know. Well, I think more of his brother-in-law, Al, oh, I see. Okay. who said, we have all these problems in mental health and not a single psychiatrist. And Jack said he'd do something about yeah. it. And of course Jack did. I mean, he uh, he uh, exerted wonderful leadership in the mental health board. He, uh, he, uh, he approached the supervisors uh, as a, a senior physician in the community. Uh, they respected him. They listened to him. Uh, he had ready access, particularly to Ernie Debs, who was the supervisor who supervised our department, if you remember Debs. Mm -hmm. yes. and, um, and I do want to say I, I recruited 
what I felt was an excellent staff with one disappointment. Um, I found it very difficult to find a research psychologist to head up the research uh, division of the department. Um, largely because I was spoiled. In Topeka, I had the privilege of working with some of the most outstanding um, clinical psychologists, I would say, in the world. These included uh, people um, like um, Schlesinger, um, Rappaport, um, uh, Robert Holt, um, a number of others who were clinicians and serious researchers as well. And these people could turn out a Rorschach test that was so enormously helpful, such as I have never seen from many. And, and each one of these people went on to have very distinguished careers. Um, um, Holtzman, Phil Holtzman is one of them, is now Emeritus Professor of Psychology. Okay. Back up to uh, uh, your comments about him. Uh, about about uh, Phil Holtzman? Yes. Yeah, Phil was one of these psychologists who went on to become uh, a professor, now emeritus professor of psychology at Harvard. This was a trained analyst in the Department of Psychology at Harvard, which was not necessarily, nor do I think it ever was, that congenial mm -hmm. to psychoanalysis. Um, at any rate, I was looking for somebody like that to be our chief of psychology. Uh, and I was, I, I was forced to accept somebody of much lesser capacity, unfortunately. He was a man whom I not only liked but loved personally, but he had serious limitations in conceptualizing the kind of research that I had hoped uh, could continue along the lines of what Garfinkel and I have begun, for instance, doing research on social role, doing research on whether, in fact, the particular program philosophy that I had developed was making any difference, and uh, by what criteria, and so forth. Uh, this was a man who was really primarily a statistician, and under his guidance, we actually did collect some very useful statistics that uh, helped us in our state uh, reports to the state and so forth. Uh, and some of these were epidemiological in the broad sense, uh, but, but they were not the cutting edge kinds of research that I had hoped for. Then Arita came as uh, George Mowat's assistant, and uh, Arita too, I would say even less than George, was not a clinician and she isn't now, and she never has been. And um, although a very warm and compassionate and, and really passionate person with regard to the notion of service to the community, based, I feel, on her own committed Christianity, uh, I think that's where that came from. I think, uh, Arita came from a, um, a Protestant minister's family. I think now one of her children is a minister. And it, it was from that wonderful, broad, uh, humanistic aspect of the Christian belief and practice that she uh, came. And she was very helpful, too. We also had a number of other people, but they were mainly doing um, population type statistics, and frankly, 
that was a disappointment to me. You said that you had to take him. I had to take him because nobody else applied. And I wanted to get something going. Perhaps I was too impatient and should have left the uh, position open for longer. But I did consult with people uh, like Holtzman and Holt and Schlesinger and nobody, nobody materialized. Uh, so let me see, is there anything else? Um, we opened the first two clinics in the black community and uh, and I set up those clinics to have community boards that were, in a certain ways, analogous Was to the Mental a, Health a, Advisory Board. A, just after the Watts riots of '65. Yeah, yes, yes. And so each each um, local regional mental health service had a community board, and the the, the design was to have those people consult with the uh, clinic personnel on the needs of the community and also to give them feedback on uh, the effectiveness of the clinical services. So that was a very strong uh, community orientation. We also opened up the first bilingual uh, mental health service in East LA and um, our first director was Marvin Carno, mm -hmm. who uh, I recruited from UCLA mm -hmm. and who went back to UCLA after a couple of years, but at least he, he started it. And um, he, he was okay. His wife, I don't know whether, I suppose Marv's still alive, his wife, Adriana, who was an architect, uh, is of Mexican orientation, or uh, origin. And um, so that um, Marv had a feeling for the culture. Um, when he left, I looked for another bilingual psychiatrist. And recruited one about whom I had doubts. He came, now I, my memory fails me, either from one of the Central American countries or Colombia, Venezuela, one of the northern South American countries. And it was very clear to me that he was a member of an elite class and and had not very much interest in poor people and so forth. He he met the outward requirements of bilinguality and so forth. And when we appointed him, it was a disaster. He he um, he showed contempt for poor mm -hmm. people and and uh, while he could speak the language very fluently, um, he didn't have a feeling for the problems of, of uh, discrimination and, and poverty and so forth. Um, so we got rid of him, and I don't remember who we had after that. Um, when I left, um, Uh, Herb Robinson, who was a black psychiatrist and my chief deputy, took over. And to my do my knowledge, he did a, a an acceptable job, but he did not get the permanent position. And it then went to again. I'm forgetting. His whose relationship with the community was abysmal. At that time, 
after I left the job, I was elected uh, president of the Southern California Psychiatric Society. Helpers, that's his name. J.R. Helpers. Dick mm -hmm. Helpers. Do you know him? Yes. Yeah. And Helpers was an imperious, arrogant, um, uh, condescending kind of man who um, had extremely poor relationships with his fellow psychiatrists in the community and um, antagonized them, and antagonized a number of other people until he was finally asked to leave. And somehow he got the plum of being um, uh, the head of the consultation liaison which used to be called psychosomatic medicine, at, at Harvard. Elpers, number one, was not a clinician. Number two, had never done any research or writing in, in anything having to do with clinical psychiatry. It was an absolutely uh, ridiculous assignment. He has not, as far as I know, subsequently distinguished himself in that field. It was purely is he still political. there? I'm sorry? I think he may be. I, I think he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I don't understand that, that with the coming of, of Jolly West, who I think you know died, yes. um, there was a tremendous uh, burgeoning of of, of scientific excellence in the department, uh, concentration on research, and, and a lot of, uh, of emphasis on that, and um, how they could continue with a schlepper like that, if you'll forgive my expression, uh, as head of consultation liaison, absolutely, I don't understand. He may have had something on one of the supervisors and in mm -hmm. one way or another possibly extorted his way into that position. He was the one that went around claiming that he was the first director mm -hmm. of the uh, If you listen carefully, you may possibly detect some feeling I have about Albert's. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, yes, it would be hard to discern that. <laughs> Thank I'm, you. I'm, gl think, I'm glad I've concealed it so well. <laughs> I think you have a lot of uh, company uh, with regard to him. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, gratified to hear mm -hmm. that. And um, at any rate, uh, then it went to a, um, a social worker from New York of, of a Cuban background, I believe, or oh, Puerto Rican who I understand also didn't have much of a feeling for some of the problems of discrimination and poverty and so forth, I began to, to um, take less and less interest in the program. So that now, um, in a way, I regret to say I have almost no interest in it. Um, I think in certain ways it's been a success in other ways, it's been a dismal failure, not because of things that I neglected to do, or for that matter, any of my successors neglected to do, but because there wasn't the serious uh, commitment on the part of the state to funding these programs where they could truly provide an alternative to state hospitalization. Um, that's about it. Um, there was quite a shift in attitudes towards mental health programs between the time you started and the time you left the uh, UCLA program. Yes. You want me to say something about that? Yes, I think so. Yeah, there, uh, the John Birch Society, which at that point was uh, perhaps in a way an, an, an outgrowth of McCarthyism, or connected with it and so forth, went around the community um, 
with the preposterous assertion and claim that uh, establishing mental health services in local communities was a way for big government to uh, exercise mind control over innocent citizens. And as a matter of fact, they even said that there was a plot to, um, to arrest uh, innocent citizens who disagree with government policy and send them to a presently unused large army hospital building in Whittier, Alaska. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember that. Um, as a matter of fact, um, the Al this set, had, been, had just set up a um, steering committee to get through some mental health legislation with uh, Louis Bullock as the chairman. They got him because he knew that uh, Bullock was for anything that other people were against. And this is how he talked him into mental health. And that, and Al just at that point had a massive heart attack. And um, it was the beginning of the, of the summer. He had it on commencement day. And we didn't think he'd pull through it. And he kept worrying about what was going to happen to his committee. And I said, do you want me to staff it for a while? And so I did for that whole summer. And one of the first things I had to do was to talk to a group in Pasadena, uh, Minute Women. And they raised the question. They didn't raise the question. They made the point that all the mental health people did was to send the police in the middle of the night and they would yank somebody out and send them to Alaska because the new Neuropsychiatric Institute was being established there with federal money was still a territory. And um, uh, I was kind of taken aback by this. It was the first time I had heard this. Uh, I le realized later it came out of the John Birch group, oh, yeah. uh, but um, I got around it because uh, since I was teaching the history of social welfare, I asked them if they knew Benjamin Rush, and of course he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and I said, you know, he's the father of psychiatry. Well, they were quiet <laughs> after that. That was very good. So, but I, you're talking about that. I've really forgotten. Oh, yeah, that. there was a lot of that. Uh -huh. And, you know, there were um, some groups in the communities, uh, women almost entirely, um, who um, uh, formed, uh, that were formed to, uh, to, um, counter these uh, John Birch type of, um, um, assertions and um, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, there was one called, I think it was AID before AIDS came out for mental health, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, these were local women primarily in West Los Angeles, and I remember they had me talk to them, and they were very, very much interested in being politically active and in, in contacting the Board of Supervisors, and they did. I know they did. These were, you know, really highly intelligent, uh, alert, aware women in the community, uh, and, uh, you know, back at the time when most intelligent women were housewives, and didn't have careers such as you had. And um, so um, so there was a lot of community ferment back and forth. And I remember I spent quite a few uh, evenings at dressing rooms, including the County Medical Association, of which I was a member, uh, where there was a lot of 
negativity about psychiatry and mental health and, and so forth. That's where uh, Louis Bullock finally came in. Yes, he, he was, was president uh, then. He was president. And he set up a mental health committee to control those people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the other person I think of is Roger Egerberg. Do you remember yes. Roger? Oh, yes. Very, very delightful, hearty, uh, friendly old Swede who um, was very avuncular, very avuncular toward me. And uh, because I came to work prior to the establishment of the separate department, so technically I was part of what was then called the Department of Charities yes. under yes. Bill Barr. You remember Bill Barr? Oh, indeed, I do. <laughs> and Bill, Bill was, I think he was anti-mental health. Oh, very yes, he was. Yeah, I'm sure of that. Very confrontative and so forth. But Roger, Roger was wonderful. I mean, he was wonderful to me, very avuncular, made me feel comfortable and home, and told me that he would do anything within his power to be helpful to me, that it was all in favor of the separate department, and because I told them that if they don't establish the uh, separate department, uh, I was going to go back to UCLA on my knees and mm -hmm. ask for that position. <laughs> I turned down. <laughs> so uh, he didn't do it just to keep me. He did it because. I really think he was. In, was that your impression? Too? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I think so. Yeah. So I mean, I felt was a very poor successor to uh, to Egerberg. Um, okay. Anything else that you like me to comment? Well, um, now you spend all your time in private practice. Um, for a number of years, my major activity has been private practice. I became more and more involved in psychoanalysis. I became a training analyst uh, a couple of years after I left the county and have been a training analyst since then. And I think you know what that amounts to. Um, and then for five and a half years, uh, I was dean of the uh, Southern California Psychoanalytic Institute. I took on the job because the Institute was coming apart. There was a big crisis. Pardon me. And uh, there were a number of people, I'm sorry, who um, wanted the Institute to go in a drastically different direction. Most of them got together with others and formed a third institute, which is called the ICP Institute for Contemporary Psychoanalysis, which is not affiliated. I wasn't aware of that. Oh, yeah. It is, it's not affiliated either with the American Psychoanalytic or the International Psychoanalytic. Uh, poor old Jack would have been very upset about that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, while it wasn't good for him to pass away, it's good that he didn't have to go through the pain of that. And um, and so the Institute was very torn, and people, uh, out of knowing that I had built programs and so forth, asked me to take over as dean, and I did that. And um, the Institute is together now. I, I got a lot of good help from a number of people, and I worked very, very hard on it. I was very hands-on dean. Uh, my dear wife never complained. There were many weeks when I went to a meeting every evening. And um, as a result, we built up, I think, a very, very innovative and special curriculum. Uh, I took more and more of a um, it was an opportunity for me to develop more and more of my philosophical interests so that for now seven or eight years, I teach a course on uh, 
psychoanalytic epistemology where I get the psychoanalytic students to come to grips with uh, the truth claims of psychoanalysis and, and how these are challenged and what, what, the, um, what, what the issues are. It's been a very successful course. It's also led to some writing I've done, and I've published a couple of things uh, that are related to epistemology, and I'm currently on a major writing project uh, which will produce either a paper and or possibly a book. And um, I have already been asked by the Austin Riggs um, Clinic, you know about Austin Riggs? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, I do. Yeah, to make a presentation to them next spring based on some of my prior writing. So you can see I've made quite a turn in my career. Uh, I had, um, after I left the deanship, or really during the time I was dean, I reduced my practice to about half time so I could have time to do my research and my writing and so forth. And that now occupies me. I have a situation in which I am doing my writing, I'm doing teaching at the Institute and at UCLA, and uh, I am seeing my patients. And it's, for me, a wonderful balance. I have absolutely no thought of You're retiring. enjoying this. I'm enjoying it hugely. I have no interest in retiring. People ask me, I guess when they look at me, are you still working? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're too young to not be working. Oh, I'm only 75. <laughs> yeah. That's still much younger than I am. So. Really? Do you mind my asking? I'm 86. I'll oh. be 87 in December. God bless you. That is wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. You're, I think, every bit as alert as when I knew you years ago. Well, I hope so. I believe some of the stuff they're saying about brain cells are <laughs> being added as you're getting older. Well, you know, we know there there's research that does confirm that if you stay active, mm -hmm. uh, in, in particularly cerebrally, you're not going to have any loss of function unless your genes, you know, condemn you to something like Alzheimer's or something yeah. like that. But Fortunately, mine, I'm not doing that. Yeah, wonderful. And, and uh, I notice you walk with a cane, so yes. you, you have some... I have some arthritis. Yeah. Uh, my knee will suddenly buckle, uh -huh. and I go down if I'm not supported. Yeah. doesn't hurt. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely wonderful. I'll tell B about it. B, of course, remembers you mm -hmm. quite fondly. I remember her. Yeah. Tell me about your family. Um, you had two children. I have two children. Uh, my older son, Mark, actually applied, uh, he graduated from USC and applied to your school. You may have even interviewed him. Uh, he was not accepted for social work training. I think there's a reason for that, Francis. Uh, now this is, is this, is this off? I'll make sure. Uh, I really felt enriched by my experience with the mental health program. Um, I um, met the present medical director, Rod Trainer, or something, something like that, at the um, at several meetings actually, and. He has indicated to me that he would like me to come and consult with him and so forth. And I told him I really haven't been involved for years, and I seriously doubted whether I could be helpful to him. Uh, and I mean, I meant that very sincerely. Uh, if I could, of course, I would. I would do that. And he said something very kind, like, 
let me be the judge of that. Well, I think that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'd I, like I, to ask you about the articles that you write. Do you have any available for me? Oh. Uh, yes, I, I. Thank you. 